Hey everyone, thanks for joining Baltimore County Fire Department EMS Academy. Um, for those who I haven't met, my name's Sean Barinholtz. I am an anesthesia and ICU physician at Hopkins. I'm an active volunteer, Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company in Baltimore County. And I serve as one of the associate medical directors for Baltimore County Fire Department. On behalf of Baltimore County Fire Department, the uh, uh, medical director's office, Dr. Pollock, on behalf of the EMS office, Chief Shenning, Captain Stewart, Captain Fitzpatrick, Thanks for what you guys do every day. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for your dedication to lifelong learning. A big shout out to Ashley Brooks, a volunteer of Pikesville, who's helping us run the Zoom. Uh, Ashley is available in the chat. Ashley will be sending out a link at some point in this presentation to, uh, you click on that link in the chat and you fill in some information and you get your MIMS CEUs. I also want to say that, you know, we have some additional information about the MIMS CEUs. Uh, if we can stay on after the program, uh, Ashley and I will hang around and answer some questions uh, that we have received about your MIMS CEUs. Great. So uh, super, super crazy excited tonight to have with us Mike Broussard. Uh, Mike uh, started his career in the volunteer system at Carroll County as an EMT and a firefighter when he was 14 years old. For the past 26 years, Mike has worked as a CRNA or Certified Registered Nurse Anesthetist at the R. Adam Cowley Shock Trauma Center. He's an active member of the GO team working with his colleagues to ensure they remain prepared to deploy at a moment's notice. Mike received both his undergraduate nursing and graduate degrees from the University of Maryland he works full-time in the shock trauma operating rooms, providing anesthesia to critically ill trauma patients. Mike is well-versed in advanced trauma, tra traumatic airways and resuscitation of trauma patients. Mike, thanks for being here. Thanks for uh, sharing your experiences. We appreciate you. Well, thank you, Dr. Baranholtz. I wanted to uh, start off by echoing your um, comments about uh, the appreciation that I have for the men and women who uh, serve the uh, EMS fire rescue community. Um, I give this talk um, to various audiences, um, anywhere from an anesthesia group, because it is the GO team is such a, a unique um, team. We, you know, it's not very common in anesthesia. So there are some anesthesia programs that are interested in it, but the majority of the talks are given to um, folks like yourself. And I always like to start these talks by um, providing my sincere gratitude for what you do. Um, we could not do what we do at the trauma center without the amazing care that you guys provide in the field. Um, the GO team is something that's very uh, near and dear to my heart. So I'd love to spend um, the time talking about it. I was thinking about my title today, um, who we are, what we do, and when to call. And I think it's equally as important to discuss tonight um, what we are not, because there are, I think, some common um, misconceptions about the GO team, um, what we are not trying to do in the field. And, um, and I should have said um, when to call, it's equally as important to discuss um, when not to cancel. And we'll talk about all those things um, tonight during the talk. So, change slides here. There we go, sorry. So the mission of the GO team is very simple. We are a um, hospital-based um, resuscitation surgical team that is there to provide um, assistance to EMS providers throughout the state. Um, it's a pretty cool, sh pretty cool shot. We took that um, several years ago. It was, um, that's Trooper One in the background and the crew there and then we had a team of nurses that made the STC. That's the top of the heliport there at Shock Trauma. Um, and behind that, you can see that's our, our new building with our secondary heliport. Um, but that is the top of the, the trauma center there. 
Um, so we're going to talk about the, some of the go team calls that we've been on. Um, everybody loves taking great pictures. So I was not on this call. This is a, a pretty cool shot of a um, tractor trailer rollover. Um, that was a couple of years ago. So the objectives tonight are pretty simple. We're going to talk about what the go team is, um, what our training opportunities, capabilities are, what we do to keep ourselves current and uh, um, be able to provide the care that we like to provide out in the field. Um, we're gonna briefly discuss the supplies that we carry with us, um, what we carry, why we carry them, um, and things that we can bring to the scene. Um, we're gonna examine some of the internal workings of the um, GO team meaning when you in the field uh, request assistance from the GO team, how that initial request um, transitions down to us responding to the scene. Uh, we'll do a real brief uh, review of some of the demographics about our calls. And then lastly, we will do, a, um, I'm gonna do a case review on an actual case um, that I went on that was back in 2018. So like I said, the GO team is, um, we are there to provide um, support and assistance to EMS providers. And I really like to emphasize um, the word oh. work, <laughs> assistance because what we are not there to do is we're not there to provide um, all of the care. We're not there to take procedures away from field providers. I remember very distinctly um, being on a call up in Cecil County. It was a single vehicle pickup truck. Um, they had gotten the patient extricated just prior to our arrival. And when I got in the back of the medic unit, um, there was a paramedic who was holding a laryngoscope and uh, getting right into baby. He saw me and kind of had this almost disappointed look on his face, like, oh, you're going to take this from me. And I said, um, you know, have at it. The tube is all yours. If you need a helping hand, please let me know. Um, he did the direct laryngoscopy, did an amazing job, um, and got the tube in on the first try. So um, that was one of those kind of misnomers that I was talking about in the beginning. So we are there to work with you guys. We're not there to uh, take things from you. This is kind of an older picture, um, but what I really love about this picture, the fellow in the middle that's uh, Bill Howie. He's one of the CRNAs. He's been working at shock trauma for almost 30 years. Um, he just recently cut back to part-time, but has worked full-time um, at trauma for pretty much his whole career. He's an amazing guy. Uh, has written book chapters on trauma resuscitation. He's pretty well published um, and is a true student of trauma resuscitation. And what I love about this picture, you'll notice that the, uh, the flight paramedic um, on the, to the bill's right is holding his bag. And then the, the physician on the left is holding the blood cooler and all the surgical bags. And Bill is just along for the ride. So only Bill could get away with um, not having to carry any equipment onto the scene with him. So what comprises the GO team is there is one physician provider and one nurse anesthetist. A brief um, description of what a CRNA is. CRNAs are uh, critical care um, registered nurses who go back to school after a minimum of two years, but oftentimes many more years of critical care experience. And they go through a um, when I was going through the program, it was a master's program. It was 28 months. It has now transitioned to a doctorate program. So it's a little over three years. So we have um, additional training in nurse anesthesia. Um, so in case you're wondering what that term CRNA meant, um, that's what we are. The physicians on the GO team, um, they have a variety of background. There is a couple of orthopedic surgeons on the GO team. That gentleman pictured uh, to the left of the screen in the orange gloves, 
um, Dr. Slobogian. He is a uh, trauma orthopedic surgeon. Um, Dr. Pollock, who you all know very well as your medical director of Baltimore County, he is the, um, the chair of the GO team. He's in charge of the GO team. Um, he, as you know, is an orthopedic surgeon as well. Uh, we do have an anesthesiologist, Dr. Sam Galvano, who is the medical director down in Anne Arundel County. He's an active member of the team. And when he's on the scene as a GO team member, he's more there as the physician role, so to speak, not the anesthesia role, meaning he's not really focused on the um, resuscitation, line placement, things that anesthesia focuses on. He's more focused on the surgical side. He did um, become a board certified emergency medicine physician and took all of the classes required for a surgical amputation and whatnot to be a member of the GO team. Uh, we also have a few um, emergency medicine physicians who are on the GO team. Um, and they are, in addition to doing the um, emergency medicine training, they too went on and got the advanced training needed to be part of the GO team. Um, not all physicians work full time at Shock Trauma who are on the GO team. Uh, we have a handful of them. Um, Dr. Vic Burke, who I'm sure you know, um, works in the community in the ER. He's a very active member of the GO team. Um, so not all members of the GO team are university employees. Um, that person pictured in the middle, that's Crystal. Um, she's an amazing CRNA. Uh, she's a mother of four, um, has a crazy busy life, but always seems to keep herself super organized and um, just a, an amazing resource at the trauma center and very, um, active with all the training of new CRNA and CRNA students. Somehow I, my picture made it there on the right. I was returning um, from a call and somebody sent my picture in the hall. I was going back upstairs to the heliport to put my um, gear away. Um, the majority of the people on the GO team on the, um, both the physician side and the CRNA side do have a some EMS background. I think it's just kind of a natural draw for people who work in shock trauma to um, have some sort of prior um, EMT or paramedic or some sort of field experience. Um, we have a couple of um, former military. We have a couple of um, current reservists um, who are CRNAs at uh, shock trauma we're very active on the GO team. Um, we have one member who's pretty active with um, the federal um, disaster relief team, um, Bonjo Batoon, who um, is also an amazing guy. So um, the resources that we are able to draw from are, are pretty spectacular. So let's talk a minute about um, our training. We do kind of a combination of um, combined um, MSP, combined county training. Um, and we also do some in-house training as well. Um, given the fact that you know, Dr. Pollock is involved with Baltimore County and Dr. Galvano was involved with Anne County, um, the opportunities for us to go out in the community and train with you guys has been amazing, um, simply amazing. We, all the members of the team really um, thank the, uh, are thankful for the opportunities that we have to go out and train um, with you brave men and women um, out in the scene. Um, we do get to do things um, that we would never be able to um, simulate in the trauma center. Um, is when we're out in the field with you guys. So we are appreciative for that opportunity. Um, given today's um, simulation training environment, um, we do have a lot of fantastic opportunities as well to do simulation training. Um, Shock Trauma is the, um, has a program called the CSAR program. CSAR is an acronym. I'm not sure what it stands for, but it's basically it's, we are the training center for the United States Air Force. Um, they have 
physicians, they have anesthesiologists, surgeons, critical care medicine, you name it, they have it. Um, CRNAs, anesthesiologists, OR nurses, scrub techs, respiratory therapists, critical care nurses, whatever. And they come, they have people who are stationed full-time at shock trauma and they have um, classes come through and um, those people get to spend a couple of weeks at trauma. And the purpose of the C-STAR program is um, combat readiness. So people who are getting ready to deploy who have been working in a urology clinic for the past six years and get ready to go um, out to combat, um, they'll come do a C-STAR program at the trauma center um, and that makes them more ready for um, combat readiness. But one of the one of the most fantastic advantages of having the C-STAR program at trauma is their simulation lab. Um, it's simply amazing. Um, they have uh, these mannequins that do everything under the sun. They have mannequin dogs, they have everything. And um, the, the team down at the sim lab is also very helpful in helping us stay current on um, training so that we are prepared when we get out onto the scene. Uh, this is a, some pictures that we took. Uh, we were um, doing some training with Anne Arundel County. Um, they were gracious enough to let us um, use their gear, use their equipment, and we did some um, dolls of life training. We did some um, patient entrapment rescue training, um, got to do some mannequin intubations um, with a patient who was, you know, on the side of a car or slipped over upside down. Um, so we're able to use our instruments and um, intubate somebody who's laying sideways in the ditch or laying sideways in a car. So again, these opportunities that we have um, are really fantastic. This picture here, this is um, the SIM center for the, uh, not this is the one for the C stars. This is just the SIM center for the trauma center. And we do some training um, just to make sure that we're current on um, readiness, meaning we'll do a mock, you have a go team call, we're gonna time you, how long is it gonna take you to go get the drugs at the um, Pixis? go to the heliport, grab all the equipment and be ready for either an air transport to the scene via helicopter or a ground transport to the scene via the Maryland Express Care. And Maryland Express Care is the uh, in-house transport system that the University of Maryland um, operates. And they are um, helpful um, in us to get to if the helicopters are down due to weather or if it is a call that's very close to the trauma center or down the city, for example, um, the Maryland Express Care will take us there. So um, we're able to do some training down in the field, simple things like placing a tourniquet or putting on a pelvic binder, um, those kind of things. If, Unless you do them, as you guys know, unless you do them repeatedly um, in a controlled setting, you're not gonna be able to do them in a chaotic scene setting. So um, we do, I'm not trying to belabor this, but we do take our um, training very seriously because we want to be able to um, provide the care that we say we're able to provide in the field. And that care cannot be provided if it was not for um, all our training opportunities. We also get to spend some time with MSP. Um, that's uh, the picture on the right there. That's uh, doing some helicopter training. Um, we've done some of their um, water egress training where they put their simulator underwater and you have to train on um, being able to extricate yourself from the helicopter uh, while it's underwater. God forbid that it should ever happen. Um, so we are thankful for our close relationship um, with the MSP as well. So what are, what are our capabilities in the field? Um, it really does vary depending on the call, obviously. But um, 
we consider ourselves experts on traumatic airways. That's what we do for a living. Um, so if somebody has a, a severe amount of facial trauma, um, be it from um, murder vehicle accident or some sort of crush injury, what have you, um, we are, are well versed in those type of airways. So we're able to um, do some advanced airway control. Um, we're very used to intubating people with um, suspected cervical spine injuries. Um, advanced IV access, we do carry with us um, some central line kits. Um, we're all versed in IOs as you guys are as well. Um, we're able to provide anything from simple sedation to, to full general anesthesia in the field. Um, sometimes Banjo was on a call out in Western Maryland um, a couple of years ago and there was a guy who was a driver of a concrete truck and he was pinned against a guardrail and they had to, um, they got him to a point where they were ready to separate the front of the cab from where it was crushing his leg and they just needed to get him um, asleep enough to tolerate that and Banjo was able to give him just a little bit of Versed and ketamine um, long enough to, to stun him to get his um, leg pulled out so um, we can do something um, as simple as that um, but we're also able to provide, if the patient needs to be intubated, we do carry with us some longer acting muscle relaxants and some um, longer acting anesthetics to provide general anesthesia in the field. The, um, our surgical bags, um, we are able to do some simple things like chest tube placement. Obviously, hemorrhage control is a critical mission um, for any kind of trauma resus. So uh, tourniquet placement, um, we do carry with us an amputation um, equipment tray should we have to um, cut off somebody's limb to save their life. Um, the last thing you see listed there, that's something called a rubella. Um, rubella really has been a game changer in trauma medicine. Rubella stands for um, resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta. And what that means is um, we insert a small catheter, a small introducer into the uh, femoral artery. And there is a catheter that's inserted up into the aorta. And there's different zones, zone one, zone two, zone three. And we're able to inflate the balloon um, based on where we think the trauma, um, where the hemorrhage is occurring. Meaning if it's a pelvic hemorrhage from a crush injury, obviously we would do a much lower balloon inflation. If it was something more um, sternal, chest, um, vital organs, we would be higher up in the catheter and inflate the balloon there. Um, and what that does is it stops the hemorrhage and allows for um, us to get bleeding control. Um, we have never placed a rubella in the field, um, but we are now carrying them. Um, one of the physicians that I forgot to mention in the beginning of my talk um, is a trauma surgeon who is also a board certified um, vascular surgeon. Um, Dr. Cundy, and um, he has become a very active member of the GO team here recently, and um, he is one of the leading experts on uh, rubella, um, and it's something that we're using at the trauma center more and more, and um, if we have the capabilities of doing that in the field, um, it could be a true uh, game changer for the patients. Um, this is a picture of the equipment that we carry. We have um, standard um, turnout gear, boots, pants, jackets, helmets. Um, we take that with us. All of this is stored up in the heliport bunker up in the trauma center. Um, so we, it has a variety of sizes from our smallest um, provider to our largest provider. 
Um, so we're able to carry those with us. Um, we also carry um, an ultrasound. Um, ultrasound has also been a game changer um, in the world of anesthesia and the world of trauma resuscitation. Um, being able to use uh, ultrasound for vascular access or being able to use ultrasound to assess for um, any sort of bleeding, doing a fast exam um, on the patient's abdomen, just a very crude measurement to see if they have a belly full of blood. Um, we can check for um, lung sliding to see if the patient has any sort of tension pneumo. So instead of doing um, a blind um, needle decompression for a suspected pneumo, we can take the ultrasound probe. Um, it's a pretty simple exam. You just uh, stick it up on the chest and you look for lung sliding. Um, we're all fairly versed in that. We keep ourselves current on it. Um, so we're able to see if the patient does have a, a pneumothorax or not. Um, amazingly, one of our CRNAs at Trauma, uh, Matt Belzac, he is a certified um, ultrasonographer. He took the time to um, do all the certification on ultrasonography and did all the clinical um, requirements to become board certified in ultrasonography. So um, having that wealth of knowledge is amazing. Um, so, so oftentimes, if I know I'm going to place a line in the operating room, uh, be it an arterial line or be it a central line, I'll run up to the heliport and grab our ultrasound that you see here pictured to the left, um, just so I'm very familiar with it. And I can, if I have to use it on the scene, I'm not fumbling around on how to turn it on or how to get the probe in line or the different nuances of it, because it's a little bit different than the ultrasound equipment we use in the OR. Um, so we encourage providers to, you know, to use that on a periodic basis. Uh, the bag to the right, that is our um, airway bag. It carries all your standard um, endotracheal tubes, uh, laryngeal mask airways, LMAs, um, different IDs, uh, kits, and that kind of thing. Uh, we carry with us something called a GlideScope Go. Um, the GlideScope Go is a, um, the port portable version of the GlideScope. Um, it's very good to use for patients who have a sus suspected C-spine injury. You could easily intubate somebody um, in a C-color using the GlideScope. Um, or if you have a poor view with the laryngoscope, you can switch to the GlideScope. Um, the reason why we, we carry our own stuff, because sometimes we'll get asked, you know, a lot of um, field units carry a lot of the equipment that we're carrying with us, you know, why not just use theirs? And I think our response, my response is, you don't want your first time using a piece of equipment to be um, on a chaotic scene and you're nervous and you're, um, you know, your, your heart is pounding and you have to get this airway in. Um, GlideScope is the video laryngoscope that we've used at Shock Trauma forever. So we're all very familiar with the, the nuances of the GlideScope. So um, we kind of, we like to carry what we're used to using um, because we think that makes a difference in the field. Um, it does get a little cumbersome when you're carrying um, a big surgical bag, an airway bag, an ultrasound machine, um, blood, um, you know, we don't always travel lightly, but um, I think it's important for us to travel with equipment that we train with and travel with equipment that we use every day. And the GlideScope Go um, is a classic example of that. Um, we have a medication bag um, that's stocked by our uh, in-house pharmacy and it has an expiration date on it. And they keep it current as far as um, making sure all the medications are not expired in there. The laundry list of um, medications, we have some short-term muscle relaxant, some long-term muscle relaxant, um, some opioids, um, some carrageladot, fentanyl. Um, we have some medications for, for treat uh, high blood pressure, medications to treat low blood pressure, 
Um, we carry with us some sodium bicarb for fresh injuries um, and what have you. So we, we think it's important to carry all this stuff with us. It does seem like a long laundry list, but um, we think it's vital to treat the patient properly in the field when we have um, this, these medications at our disposal. We also carry some uh, TXA, um, transexamic acid, which um, you guys are probably using now in the field. Um, forgive me, I don't know all of the Baltimore County EMS protocols. No, we're not. You're not, okay, thank you. I know the, um, the medics on the helicopters are now carrying TXA. Um, and TXA is a good upfront drug because it helps um, prevent the breakdown of clot. So um, patients who are making clot um, in a, a trauma uh, recess, they oftentimes will break down those clots quickly. So the administration of TXA will um, help prevent the breaking down of the clots so the patients um, don't bleed as much. So that is something that we're carrying with us. Uh, we carry blood products. Um, we also, within the past two years, I guess 19, I'm sorry, 2019, so three years, we just purchased a portable um, blood warmer, the Belmont Buddy. Um, it is a battery packed um, blood fluid warmer. So we're able to give the patients warm um, blood or warm fluids in the, on the scene. That's something that's um, critical um, in the recess of a trauma patient. Some people say giving a patient ice cold blood um, is almost as dangerous as not giving any blood at all. So us having the ability to use a portable warmer, um, I think has really become a game changer. Um, we have with us two units of packed red blood cells and two units of um, uncrossed matched FFP. If we know for sure um, before we leave that the patient is um, a female of childbearing age, we will carry with us O negative blood, um, but because O positive is um, much more readily available, if we do not know the um, sex or the age of the patient, will take with us uncross-matched O positive blood. Um, at the trauma center, we um, recently, probably within the last three years, have started using quite a bit of um, whole blood. Um, we're now using whole blood at the trauma center for our initial um, severe traumatic injured patients. We have not begun to carry whole blood with us out on um, the scene. Um, the benefits of whole blood are, there are many. Um, it has in it all the clotting factors, all of the platelets, all of the fresh um, red blood cells in it. And because it has such a short shelf life, meaning it doesn't last as long, so it doesn't have all the preservatives in it that the, um, the products that are broken down have, um, it does have, a, it has a short shelf life. So it's always fresh. And blood that's been kind of sitting around um, on a shelf of blood bank after time, it loses um, some of its critical characteristics for resuscitation. So stale blood is nowhere near as good as fresh blood. Um, the problem with whole blood for us is that it is not as readily available as broken down blood products. And when we take blood out of the hospital and we don't use it, it gets wasted. And because whole blood is so precious, um, we do not want to take the risk of wasting whole blood. But um, as it becomes more readily available, if that day ever comes, um, I would not be surprised if one day in my lifetime, um, we'd have the capability of giving whole blood out in the field, which I think would also be a true game changer. Um, we also carry some 3% hypertonic uh, saline solution. Um, that is used for uh, patients who have a suspected traumatic brain injury. Um, it decreases the swelling in the brain after a TBI. And 
Um, the sooner it's given, the better. So um, we in the trauma center will hang 3% upon admission for patients who have um, suspected TBI via an obvious injury to the head or a altered LOC um, because drugs and alcohol are such a common theme in, in the trauma world. You never know if the patient's um, not acting right because of a substance that they ingested or some alcohol that they consumed or a traumatic brain injury. So if it is if a TBI is suspected, um, we are able to administer that 3% hypertonic saline um, in the field. So when you guys out in the field um, request a go team, it goes, you guys will request it through your um, 911 system and then it'll go to um, MIMS and then MIMS will give it to, um, we'll call Express Care, which again is our in-house um, transport system. And um, they are the ones that do the, does all the internal in-house activation the go team. But this is probably the most important slide of all of the, of the whole talk. And the reason why I say that is because if you think you're going to have a prolonged extrication, regardless of the reason, meaning you think you're going to be on the scene for an extended period of time, the best thing to do is to call the GO team early. If we get canceled, that's fine. We don't, I never mind leaving the operating room and hopping on a helicopter for a flight, even if it's a short flight. Um, I think the training of us having the GO team activation is important, but it's also important that we get on the scene early to assist you guys. Um, and it's, it's more than limb um, salvaging or more than this guy doesn't need his arm cut off, so I'm not going to need to call the GO team. Um, we do have the capabilities that we have talked about tonight of um, advancing some of the resuscitation efforts for the patients. So um, even if there's not an obvious um, traumatic limb injury, um, that was kind of one of the misnomers that I was talking about in the very beginning of the talk that you know, the trauma, the GO team is just uh, is useful when you have to cut somebody's arm off. But other than that, there really isn't a, a reason to call them. Um, I think having us there early, um, we can help you guys with the resuscitation process. Um, we also try to keep current on mass casualty events. Um, to my knowledge, the GO team has never been used for a mass casualty event. Um, you know, God forbid something like the, the Boston Marathon um, tragedy or something like that happened in Baltimore. Um, we certainly would be available, um, but um, I think our, our training, to be honest, with true mass casualty events, with the exception of those who have served in the military where they really focus on that heavily, um, it may be a little, little limited, but um, we would be available to help resuscitate the patients of a mass casualty event. Um, this picture on the right, that guy with the, uh, the camouflage um, surgical cap, that was um, Banjo I was talking about. Um, I, I don't know what call that is. I'm not sure if that was a call with a concrete driver or not. Um, and then the person, um, the other person in the, with the white helmet, that's, that's Dr. Pollock, as you guys all know. So that's um, Banjo giving some... Um, if it's bicarb or some other kind of medication to a patient um, who was just extricated. The, um, the person behind Banjo, that's um, paramedic Peach, John Peach. He's a longtime Trooper One paramedic, uh, recently retired. So um, I'm not sure exactly what call that was, but it's a pretty good shot. So this screen is used more for people who are not familiar with the Maryland trauma system. You guys are all very familiar with this. Um, 
you know, we have um, eight um, state trooper helicopter medevac hangers throughout the state. Um, and then the whole golden hour theory that Dr. Kelly, who was a true pioneer in trauma medicine and a man well ahead of his time, his mission um, was to make it um, so everybody in the state of Maryland would be very close to a major trauma center. Um, there are nine trauma centers throughout the state of Maryland. Um, shock trauma is considered the park, the primary adult resource center. It's kind of a name we gave ourselves because we exceeded all qualifications for level one. Um, we have neurosurgery, orthopedic surgery, CAT scan, MRI available in-house 24-7, 365. So um, all level one trauma centers have them available, um, meaning there's somebody on call, but um, at trauma, we actually have somebody um, in-house um, 24-7, 365. Um, Johns Hopkins, as you guys know, is the um, state designated pediatric trauma center. Um, if God forbid a kid gets shot in West Baltimore, two blocks away from shock trauma, they will come to shock trauma. We've had, um, unfortunately, a, a, um, a growing number of um, young victims of um, gunshot injuries um, in West Baltimore that come to us. And when we get a patient who is a minor, the pediatric patient, the, um, the team from the pediatric emergency department comes up to the, the TRU. Um, for those of you who have never been there or never seen it, the Shock Trauma Center is a freestanding trauma center. We're physically attached to the hospital, but we are our own entity, we're our own building. Um, so if you're going to University of Maryland for a heart attack or a stroke or a bellyache, what have you, you would go to the University of Maryland emergency department. If you were coming to shock trauma for a traumatic injury, you would come to a completely different building, um, which is different than most all other trauma centers um, where most trauma centers, they have an ED and inside of the ED, there's a few trauma bays. Um, at shock trauma, the entire hospital is, des is um, a designation for trauma patients. Um, so this is what I was talking about with the, the GO team activation. Um, when the field providers um, request the GO team, it goes to Syscom. Um, Syscom contact shock trauma via the um, Express Care. Express Care sets, sends out a page. It used to be the old school way was to send out through beepers. Um, we now get cell phone activation alerts. Um, so anybody who is on the GO team, whether they're working or not, will get on their cell phone um, an activation alert. Other people in the trauma center who us responding to a GO team call impacts, meaning um, the charge nurse or the operating room, for example, also gets that alert because they know that if there's a CRNA in the operating room that has to get out to go on a, a GO team call, um, it impacts the flow of the operating room. So um, they're notified as well. Um, the charge nurse for the, anesthe uh, the charge anesthesiologist, excuse me, they get the call. Um, the people in the true get the call, the true technicians. They, the, um, the TRU technicians are super helpful for us. They are the ones that um, help get the stuff together, the charge nurse, in the TRU will take the um, uncrossed match blood. We have um, a blood dispenser right there in the, in the TRU for uncrossed match blood products. So they're able to um, remove the uncrossed match blood and put it in the cooler. Um, the cooler, all the equipment stays up in the heliport with the exception of the, um, the blood cooler because of the charge nurse in the true or one of the true nurses um, gets the blood for us and gets, puts it on ice. Um, and then, like I said, the, uh, the medication um, kit is kept in the Pixis, the uh, medication 
distribution system um, that's kept in the PIXIS in the TRU. So we get the blood and the meds from the TRU before we head up to the heliport. These are some call demographics that um, one of the providers um, put together. The, the mean age range, I know is incorrect because I, I remember being on a call quite a while back. Um, it was a Pete's patient. He was um, like seven, I believe. Um, wound up getting transported to um, Johns Hopkins. So the range that 19 to 67, I think is a little off. Um, it's really difficult there being a, um, a teaching facility in a major um, university, there always is a big focus on research um, at shock trauma. And the research on the GO team, is, it's virtually impossible to do a true research study because for that, you would need to have identical circumstances and then one has a GO team and one does not, and you see which one does better. So everything we do is kind of retrospective meaning we take a look back at the care we gave and then we deduct from there um, what kind of advantages we think we provided to the patient. Um, so it's hard to do um, true live um, randomized controlled trials um, on the GO team because um, you're not gonna randomize a patient to not get a life-saving measure out in the field. All right, I am going to end the talk with um, a presentation of a um, call that I gave um, that I was on, excuse me, back in uh, January of 2018. Um, before I get Dr. Brad Holtz, is there anything in the chat that was, had any questions about? Uh, yeah, the there's, um, there are a bunch of um, comments being shared back and forth in the chat. Um, they were wondering if you could, they would be able to receive a copy of the PowerPoint. Oh, sure. Yeah, happy to share. Uh, there was a clarification of one of the acronyms that you shared was the Center for the Sustainment of Trauma and Readiness Skills. Oh, okay. A um, bunch of folks sharing experiences. Shock Trauma Center was used for the train extraction, the Amtrak MCI incident in Baltimore County. Uh, trooper eight was cut years ago. I think that was the slide of the troopers across the state. Oh, okay. Uh, we used the GO team back in 98 on I-83 at Padonia Road. Uh, here's a question. About how many responses do you get each calendar year? Do you ever assist below grade uh, rescues like mining? Great question. Um, we average about 15 calls a year. So a little bit more than one per month. They, for some reason, seem to go in spurts. We'll go two or three months without one, and then we'll have like three in two weeks um, for whatever rhyme or reason. Um, we have had some um, swift water rescue calls. Um, mm -hmm. Drager, one of the CRNAs, and Dr. Um, Slobogian, I don't call, Dr. Bickberg was on the scene um, of a patient who was um, in a ravine. Um, as far as I had a patient who was, he was uh, um, digging a foundation next to a house for an addition and he was buried, um, the trench collapsed and he was completely buried um, initially over his head in um, clay and mud, there's a lot of rain. Um, so when we got there, you could see his head, but the rest of his body was covered. Um, we had some silo calls. Um, but as far as like the question asked, cave rescue, is that what it, it asked? Or, um, mining. Mining. To my knowledge, no, but that we may have. I don't know. I, don't, I cannot recall any particular mining um, calls, but they, they are a lot more than just um, NBCs. A lot of them are industrial or right. in that nature. Uh, hey, everyone, Ashley sent around the sign-in. Take a look at the chat. Uh, mm -hmm. She sent a, that around. Um, there was a question. When would we call the GO team 
versus troopers and how do you how do you guys complement each other great question um so you would do it you would request a go team in the same manner that you request um, a trooper so if you, you call dispatch dispatch call syscom for a trooper um we complement each other very well we we do fly alongs COVID has um, kind of put a halt on them, but we would spend um, time with MSP doing a 12 hour shift with them doing fly alongs for, uh, we would spend a day or night, usually the day um, in one of the bunkers and go out on the calls with them to become more familiar with helicopter safety and, and scene rescue. Um, so, just like this go team call that I already discussed, um, Trooper Six was already um, on the scene, and Trooper One um, was left um, Martin's Air Force, Martin's Air Force, Martin's base, whatever it's called, and brought us to to the scene. So, I think the question may have also been more about you know, as providers in the field, how do they decide when oh. to call the helicopter and when to call the go team? Yeah. So anything that is prolonged extrication, prolonged scene time, that's probably the biggest take home message. If we never want you guys to um, prolong scene time, meaning if you can get the patient to the trauma center swiftly and quickly, please do so. If, you're on, if you think when you get on the scene, that the patient is heavily entrapped. If, if you're going to be on the scene for quite a while, please call us. Um, and you can make that determination based on your initial field assessment. So once you arrive on the scene, be it NBC, be it um, some sort of rescue, some sort of entrapment, if you think you're gonna be there for a while and you think the patient's critically injured, please call us. Um, the, another thing that, another message I want to break home with you, one of our retrospective looks at our calls was once the patient is extricated, we oftentimes automatically get canceled because the field providers think, well, the patient is extricated, we no longer need to go to you. My recommendation and the recommendation of everybody at the shock trauma center is if we are close to the scene, please do not cancel us. Allow us to come and help with the resuscitation of the patient and help you guys bring the patient back to the trauma center. If it's going to prolong and it's, I can't give you an exact amount of time, but you, if, if you're able, if SISCOM is able to tell you Trooper one with the go team is 10 minutes out and you're about ready to get the patient extricated, let us come to the scene and help you guys. If they tell you that we're 45 minutes out because you're in you got a central, central part of the state, but if you're on the Eastern shore or in Western Maryland, if we are far away and the patient's extricated, ready to come to the trauma center, by all means, do not wait. But if it's a short amount of time and you think that we can help you with a critically ill patient, do not cancel us just because the patient has been extricated. Allow us to come to the scene and give you guys and girls a hand in the resuscitation of the patient. Is Good answer. Dr. Reynolds? Yeah, perfect. Okay. I agree. Is there a part of the state that you respond to more than others, like Western part? Um, not really. No, I don't know, not sure if we ever did a, a true um, demographic breakdown um, of the ge geography of the state. Um, I myself, the furthest west I've been is Allegheny County. Um, the furthest east I've been is this call, which is um, I was west of the Bay Bridge, but um, east of Easton. Um, so I know we've had calls where we've gone in the Salisbury, um, that one call Bonjo was on, I think was out in Cumberland. So we've, we've ex expanded to the furthest points um, east and the furthest points west. I had a call up in Cecil County up near Delaware. We've taken patients um, to 
um, Delaware hospitals before. Um, there was a call. The call was off in Cecil County, Maryland, um, but the weather turned. Um, it started to snow. Snow was in the forecast, but it started to snow heavier than they thought. So they wound up transporting the patients um, to a Delaware trauma center instead of coming back to Baltimore. Um, mm -hmm. To my knowledge, I don't know if you've ever gone to um, MedStar down in DC as a destination. Um, our goal is to bring the patient back to Baltimore. Um, but I know for that one instance, we, we took a patient to a Delaware trauma center instead of Baltimore. Do you ever respond to out-of-state events? Myself, no, but the GO team has. We've gone to um, southern parts of Pennsylvania. Um, I don't know off the top of my head if we've ever gone into West Virginia or Virginia, um, but we have responded to calls up in PA. Um, and that one call was right on the Delaware line up in Cecil County. Uh, there's a question, refresh my memory on how to sign in. So Ashley sent out a link. Ashley will post it again. Click on the link, fill out some information, get your MIMS CE used. How long does it take you to be mobile and in the air? Good question. Um, our goal is 10 minutes, which for you guys, it seems like an eternity. Um, your response time is um, probably less than two, but for us to be completely from the moment we get the call to the moment we're on the either on the heliport if we're going by air or by the ambulance bay if we're going by land is 10 minutes fully dressed with all of our gear. Um, and we will find out if it's there's nobody quote unquote on call for the GO team. So the GO team physician is sometimes a little bit more in question. There's always a CRNA um, at the trauma center. We work 24 seven, 365. But sometimes the physician who responds um, might be Dr. Vickberg or one of the community physicians. Um, so he will communicate through um, Express Care whether he's going to meet us at the trauma center or meet us on the scene. So sometimes we will leave the trauma center just with the CRNA and then we'll meet the physician provider on the scene. But we should be up and ready to go um, in 10 minutes or less. And that is one of the trainings that we do. How long do you think it would take you to get from shock trauma to somewhere like Rockville? Uh, we could get there. With the new helicopters, the AW 139s, we can get there in, I don't know, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. They, they fly fast. Um, yeah, I think that's it for now. All right. Well, let's um, we'll end the talk with um, a quick uh, case presentation on a call that I was on. And then we can take more questions. Um, so this was a uh, call that I was on. It was actually the same day as the polar bear plunge in uh, Sandy Point State Park. And it was the go team call. We had the activation at 7.15 in the morning. Um, all we knew was it was an MVC rollover. Uh, Trooper 6 was on the scene. Trooper 1, um, was leaving Martins and coming down to pick us up. Um, this is a picture that I snapped outside the window of Trooper One as we were doing our um, circling prior to landing. Um, that picture that you see there, that is Route 50. The top part is Route 50 westbound. The bottom part is Route 50 eastbound. And then where all the emergency apparatus is located, that is an off-ramp. Um, and that's where the accident occurred. It was a um, truck driver who was um, leaving Atlanta, I think it was, heading to um, his final destination was somewhere on the Eastern shore. He fell asleep at the wheel and his truck went off of 50 um, onto an exit ramp and then rolled into a a ditch next to an exit ramp 150. Um, that that's a lot of members of the, um, the Graysonville Fire Department. That was the primary um, scene 
um, unit that was there. When we got there, um, we landed at the University of Maryland owns a freestanding um, emergency room kind of um, center. And that's, we used their helipad to land. Trooper six was on the scene. And then there was a field provider that took us um, from that facility to the scene. Um, we had to climb down kind of a pretty steep, muddy, um, ravine to get to the patient. This is a picture that was snapped. Um, 50 year old, 50 some year old guy um, for the purpose of the talk to prevent any HIPAA violations, which is called John. Um, John was a guy in his 50s. Um, he was heavily trapped um, under his, uh, you can't see it under the photo there, but under his um, blankets there, his left arm was actually hanging out of the window. He had the wind, it was cold, it was a bitter cold morning, um, but he was getting tired and in an effort to stay awake, he said he had the window down um, and he had his arm was hanging out. Um, he was conversing, he was able to tell me his name, he was able to tell me a little bit of health history um, he was not the best health historian by any stretch of the imagination. Um, took a little orange pill for his blood pressure and a little green pill for his diabetes. Um, very heavy smoker, um, smoked two plus packs a day. Um, but he was awake, he was communicating, he had an intact airway. Um, the field providers uh, prior to my arrival were able to establish um, an 18 gauge IV. Um, and it's right in the cubital. Um, they did an amazing job getting that IV in um, before we got there. Um, the patient had um, an obvious fracture to his left arm, which is kind of hanging out the window. His, what was causing the, the most time in extricating the patient was the fact that his, you could not even see his left leg um, below the knee. It was completely pinned um, inside um, of a cab, and they were trying their best to um, pull the cab away from his leg um, enough to get it out and get the patient extricated. Um, when I was talking to him, he said his um, his left leg was numb. I listened to his lungs; they're very coarse, um, probably more from his smoking than the injury. Um, we found out later um, from the, um, the environmental um, responders that the substances that he was carrying in the back of the trailer um, were possibly uh, hazmat material. So um, later on in the scene, these humongous fans were set up to um, blow air away from the track there, which made the, the bitter cold morning even colder with those huge fans in place. Um, there was not a lot of room down there. This picture makes it look like um, it was, but you can see his, his right knee was resting on a, a tree that, that had knocked over, was knocked over by the tra tractor trailer. Um, so I knew every time I was down there, treating the patient or assessing the patient, I was in the way of the um, heavy duty rescue guys getting him out. So I set up um, with Syscom uh, an every 15 minute alert, meaning I wanted them to announce every 15 minutes. So it was 8.30, 8.45, 9, 9.15, what have you. And I also wanted a total time reminder that was more for myself and Dr. Slobogian. The, the, you saw his picture earlier, we were two providers on the call. Um, so we wanted to know um, how long the patient was there and what, how long we were into the, into the incident. Um, we were able to get him out uh, probably after about two hours. Um, the, they did an amazing job hooking up every time they were trying to pull the bottom of the, the tractor trailer open. There was, nothing, there was no stable grounds 
for them to hook the chains up to, um, to kind of pull away the trailer. Um, I was contemplating giving him some sedative um, on the scene, but he never once complained of pain, um, never once complained of, um, you know, never once requested any kind of pain medicine. Um, my, my concern was that I would, given his heavy smoking history and his um, potential for chest injury, I did not want to suppress his respiratory efforts by giving him any opioid. Certainly, I would, that would not be the case if he was in excruciating pain or if we were requesting it. I would not deny him that. Um, so ketamine would probably be very appropriate in that situation, but he was not requesting um, any kind of pain med that was ever complaining of being in pain. Um, once we got him out, another thing that I did once I got there, I asked um, one of the field paramedic supervisors which um, unit we would go into um, and would transport us. Trooper 6 was actually sitting on Route 50, so it was a little ways away from the scene. It wasn't right on the exit ramp. It was sitting on Route 50. Um, so I had asked the operator of that rig to get the back of the medic unit as hot as he possibly could. So please keep all the doors shut and to turn the heat up um, as high as he could, because my goal was to um, begin the warming process as soon as possible. And I knew we'd have to do some exposure to do our primary survey prior to um, taking off to go back to Baltimore. So I want that to be in a nice warm environment. So the, they were able to um, get the back of the rig um, nice and hot for us. Um, once we got him out, we um, did our primary survey. Um, he was moving good air. His room air sets um, were in the low 80s. We put him on a little bit of oxygen. Um, that gave him an oxygen saturation in the 90s, which for a guy who's a heavy smoker, um, with a patent airway, um, I was happy with that. I didn't think there was any kind of need to um, intubate him given the fact that he was maintaining um, his own patent airway. We did give him two units of packed red blood cells. Unfortunately, at that time, we still had not had our portable warmer that I showed you guys earlier in the slides. Um, so we gave him two units of cold blood we gave him some FFP, um, we gave him some bicarb. Um, I started the bicarb and the calcium administration while he was still trapped um, in, the, in the rig on the tractor trailer. Um, if you've ever given um, calcium chloride to an awake patient, it gives them kind of a, um, a feeling like in like almost like a shock feeling. Um, it, it causes some strong muscle contract, contractions. So um, I warned him, I was like, you're gonna feel this thing, John, just bear with me. I'll give him like a little 100 milligram dose at a time of calcium chloride. And I wanted to give him bicarb, um, knowing that he would be acidotic from the, um, from the trauma that he had sustained. So in transport, he maintained decent um, vital signs, his blood pressure never really got low. Um, we did place a pelvic binder on him um, when we got in the back of the, of the medic unit that was on the scene. Um, Dr. Slobogian is a trauma orthopedic surgeon. So um, he thought it was, he didn't feel any instability in the pelvis, but due to mechanism, um, we appropriately decided together to, to place the, uh, the pelvic binder. Um, and then we wanted to get him uh, back to Baltimore as quickly as we could. So um, we moved the patient on Trooper 6 and then brought him to the TRU. This was not a picture of the actual scene, his actual admission. This is just a picture that um, somebody took of it. But this is a typical, if you've never been to shock trauma, this is kind of a typical trauma admission. Um, the person you see at the head of the bed, that's Dr. Mary Hyder. She's a trauma anesthesiologist who um, 
unfortunately decided to take her skills elsewhere and moved down to Alabama a couple of years ago. Uh, we miss her greatly. And then the person in the forefront, you all know that's Dr. Tom Scalia. He's there all the time, 24 7, 365. Dr. Scalia is there. Um, so we brought John to the, to the TRU. Um, we did um, an initial chest x ray. He was stable enough to tolerate um, a CAT scan. So um, we did not intubate him. Sometimes we'll intubate the patient in the true prior to going to CAT scan if we're concerned about them losing their airway or um, you know, having some more distress. So the, the best place to intubate somebody is not in a, in a CT scanner. So if we're really concerned about their airway, we'll intubate them in the TRU prior to going to CAT scan. Um, so everybody that you see on the patient's right, so Mary Hyder's right, that's kind of where the nurses and the, the TRU techs stay, stand. Um, and everybody on the right is usually the, the residents, um, the surgical team residents, the surgeons and ER docs. Um, John did go to the OR. Um, we had um, found that he had uh, an arterial injury when his, um, right off of his um, femoral artery. Um, he also had a pretty significant um, femur fracture on that left leg that was trapped under the, um, the tractor trailer. Um, his left arm was injured. Um, in the OR, we did um, an angiogram and then a, a vascular repair. Um, and then we placed an X-fix, an external fixator um, on his femur just to keep the bone, the femur bone um, straightened. Um, so that also helps control the bleeding because uh, uh, the bones bleed a lot. So when the bones are in mal malalignment, um, the quicker you're able to get them in alignment, the better. So we'll do um, what's called damage control external fixation, which is what John got. Um, we kept him intubated overnight. This is a picture of the, the OR after John left, after we took him upstairs to the ICU. Um, he received um, more blood products in the operating room. Um, we left him intubated. Um, mostly because of his um, poor respiratory compliance, um, again, probably from his um, prolonged smoking history. Um, he wound up getting exhibited on post-op day two and then was discharged on post-op day six. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, when I got there, the first thing I did, um, I went down I looked him in the eye and I said, hey, buddy, what's your name? He told me it's John. I said, I'm Mike, I'm from Shock Trauma, and we're, gonna, we're here to help you today, and we're going to save your life. And I, I tell my patients that um, just to give them that assurance, John was from Atlanta. He never heard of Shock Trauma, didn't know what it was or where he was headed, but um, I think a lot of the local citizens of Maryland do. So uh, I, that those words of encouragement, I use them quite a bit at the trauma center as well. Um, even if in the back of my mind, I'm thinking to myself, but you're not looking too good here, but I'll, I'll tell the patients that we're here for you and we're gonna do everything that we can for you to save your life because them having that positive reinforcement, I think um, goes a long way in, in their recovery efforts and, and their fight to, to survive. Um, so that was an interesting call. I learned a lot on that call. Um, the, the adverse temperatures was probably, um, this call I think was really, we were looking into getting a portable um, heater unit for blood products and for fluids. And I think this call may have um, you know, pushed the envelope a little harder to, to get one, which we, we did shortly after. Um, all right, guys. Well, I talked for a while. I'm sorry I kept it over Mike, that. that was great. That Thanks. was great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I love your comment about, you know, perhaps one of the most important things that we can do is to let our patients know that 
we're there for them, right? That they're not alone and they're safe. And, and I can share with you, you know, that I, uh, <laughs> one of my practices is in the OR as people are heading off to sleep for surgery is to say that something along the lines of, I'm here for you, we got this, you're safe, you're in good hands. Absolutely, yeah. Something like that. I think it can make me cry. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I think that that connection, I think is really important. I think yeah. patients remember that. And when I go see people afterwards, like the post-op checkup, many times people say they remember those words. No question. Yeah, no question. Yeah, it's a scary time, right? They have no idea what's going on. For sure, for sure. Yeah. Hey, a couple of questions for you in the chat. Let's see. Uh, do you, oh, it's a great question. Do you have, or do you contemplate having some basic chemistries, point of care testing on the scene? So we did look into that. We got, um, we had an older point of care um, machine that the, it was used for one of the, the, we have a lot of DOD grants and during one of the grants, um, we had a portable um, point of care um, machine that would give us pH, lactate, blood gas. The problem we had with it was um, it's very um, sensitive to temperature. So if it was a low humidity, 72 degree day, it would probably give us pretty good data. If it was January 18th, whatever this call was, and it was frigid outside, um, the data would be skewed. Um, so we are not currently carrying any point of care testing um, because of the, the wide ranges of instability um, given temperature variability. Uh, where, oh, for that patient case, was there any loss of function of limb? What was the ultimate outcome? So I went and saw John um, right before he left. Um, he did say he remembered me on the scene. Um, he was being transferred back down south to his family. Um, he wound up coming back to the operating room to get his um, internal fixation. He had an IM nail of his femur, had a nail placed to his femur bone for internal stability. And they also fixed his radius. Um, had no further um, need for intervention on his vascular injury. The initial repair um, was successful. So, um, he never came back to trauma for follow-up care. He never lost any limbs. Um, as far as his functional capacity, I'm not sure because he was lost in transition down south. But um, he was—he probably wasn't driving a truck anytime soon. He had a weight-bearing status. He couldn't bear any weight on his femur for a while, and his arm um, had, he had would have limited range of motion due to the operation. But from a functional from a function standpoint he had no amazingly had no nerve injury um no obvious foot drop he had sensation um when he was discharged from the hospital of both his hand and his feet so never had any permanent nerve injury that we could tell um so despite it all he was quite lucky and that's crazy that you said six days right those are massive injuries i mean that really speaks to the body's resilience yeah for sure for sure. For sure. Uh, lots of comments. Great. Uh, thank you. Outstanding presentation. Thank you. Absolutely incredible presentation. Wish it could be part of every EMT or paramedic class so folks know what capability the state has. Yeah, I mean, we we love giving these talks. I was um, talking talking with Dr. Baron Holtz in the beginning, and uh, one of our critical missions is um, making uh, making the community aware of who we are and what we are and what we do. So if you guys have um, requests for um, us to give similar talks to um, out there a local firehouse or to um, a class, we're happy to do so. Um, the EMS, if you just um, Google the shock trauma EMS liaison, um, her name is Becky. She, we work with Becky all the time. She knows all of us. She's working at True for 20 years. Um, her number is easy obtainable by just doing a Google search on shock trauma EMS liaison. Um, and Becky will get a hold of us and we're happy to go out and give a talk. 
Um, Bajo is giving a talk, and then uh, I think in a couple of weeks to another another audience, I'm giving a talk to the to the Carroll County group, hopefully here in the near future. So there were 120 people on this webinar. So watch out. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Hey, as well, I would add that the, you know this we're training will be recorded and posted on the Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company YouTube site. Uh, that, along with over 60 other past EMS Academy trainings, are there. Uh, amazing. Thank you. Uh, should be included presentation every EMT and paramedic refresher. Um, again, reach out to uh, Mike. Uh, thanks for an amazing, informative presentation. Superb. Want to learn more? Planning to see critical care paramedic certification in the future. Beautiful. Thank you so much for taking the time to give this talk. Outstanding. Thank you. Anne Arundel County Community College would be happy to host you. Anne Arundel Community College would be happy to host you. Wonderful. Yeah, so I think that Mike uh, suggested to reach out via uh, the MIMS EMS liaison. And, uh, shock, um, shock Trauma Liaison. So sorry. Yeah, Shock Trauma Center Liaison. Thanks. EMS. And Dr. Reynolds, I will, um, I'll just double check. The slides are, we kind of all had individual talks that we decided to, well, the university decided we should have one constant talk that we all use with different variable variability to it. Um, and I'm sure it's fine to share, um, but let me just, um, back at Shock Trauma tomorrow, let me just um, check with Dr. Pop and Dr. Galvano to make sure these slides are not the property, quote unquote, of the hospital. Great. Um, and then I'll be happy to um, send you the PowerPoint presentation and you can distribute to whoever you think is, who wants it, whoever wants it. And then somebody, Matt, offered to work with MIMFRI to get this presentation to the ALS class in Career Academies. Matt, thanks. Great. I think that's it. I'm going to stop recording.